Did you know that you can go online and find a list of documented phobias? It's quite a fascinating list. Uh, it starts with a blutophobia. Anyone? It's the fear of having a bath. Uh, the list proceeds through homilophobia, which is the fear of sermons. I don't know if only, I don't know if that's about the fear of giving sermons, which only priests have, or that is the fear of hearing sermons. You know, it could be both. It continues through lutrophobia, which is the fear of otters. Uh, onophobia, which is the fear of wine, unknown to Anglicans. And it finally ends with xenophobia. Anyone? Which is the fear of the naked mole rat. Now, you might be one who kind of sits back on the quote and says, well, there is no fear but fear itself. Uh, that's actually called phobophobia, which is the fear of having a fear. So it gets you coming and going. Now, some of these fears might seem ridiculous, but whatever it is, the reality is always the same. Fear affects us. Fear stops us in our tracks. It restricts us from living the life that is before us. Fear stops us from exploring opportunities, from enjoying the present moment, from taking leaps of faith. Fear is that which causes us to stop or maybe turn in another direction. This is what we see in the parable of the talents today. Jesus tells the story of a servant who hides the talent bestowed upon him. Because of that, he fails to enter into the master's joy. And why does he do it? Because of fear. I invite you to pick up your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 25. The first place that we need to begin with is fully understanding what is going on. Jesus tells the story about what life in the kingdom of God is like. Our reading begins, again, it will be like a man who blah, 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 blah. The it here is about life in the kingdom of God. So Jesus is trying to describe the life that he makes available to people. A life where we are in touch with his spirit. A life where where Christ is active in our life, a life where we are defined, our lives are defined by God's love, by God's grace, and by God's joy. Living in the kingdom of God, it means that we experience in our lives the richness of God's blessings, of God's, of God's presence, and, and the richness that comes from that. But we also receive the challenge and the invitation to follow him, to walk in the way of faith, he calls us to embody that kingdom, that presence of God in this world, to live as followers of Jesus. So that's what Jesus is trying to describe. This is what the living in the kingdom of God is like. And the parable that he puts forward, it really hinges on that third servant. Because of this servant receives exactly uh, the same opportunity as the other two. But where the other two, they go out and they put their talents to work, he is different. He does something else. Verse 18, he goes off and he digs a hole. Uh, the Luke account says that he wraps it in paper and he places it there never to engage in that talent until the master returns. And scripture says that it was quite a long time after a little while the master returns. So there would have been time for this servant to change his mind. There would have been time for him to see the other servants going about the master's work. And he could have gone and he could have dug it up and he could have done the same. But he ignores the call. He ignores that talent. Why? Fear. He says it in verse 24. I knew you were a hard man, harvesting where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter. So I was afraid. And so I hid your talent in the ground. Here's what belongs to you. 
fear entangles him. Fear means that he does not recognize the opportunity that he has. But not only does he not recognize his opportunity, out of fear, he doesn't see the master rightly. He sees the master as a hard, exacting, and punishing man. I knew you were a hard man, and you scatter where you did not sow, and you, you gather where you did not reap. You know, he sees this master as hard and punishing. A man who rewards probably only based on merit and is only concerned with what can you give me. Is that what we see of the master? What we see of this master is one of the extravagant generosity. The master has ownership of this, this large fortune, and he gives out talents, which are weights of silver. One talent would have been roughly $250,000 worth of silver today. So this guy, who is extremely wealthy, is supremely powerful, he entrusts roughly $2 million of his property to these three servants. And so what this represents is not necessarily a unit of money, and it doesn't represent um, you know, your ability to play guitar or to juggle or to sing well. What this represents is that the master is inviting the servants to participate in his work. This is his property. This is his money. And he doesn't bestow it upon them to do what they wish. He is inviting them to join him. So there is this openness to this master. There is this grace-filled invitation, which means that if the servants take up this invitation, they are no longer to be called servants, but co-workers. This third servant doesn't see it. Whether he sees himself as not good enough or whether he sees this master as not good, fear means that he completely misunderstands the heart of the master. Because it's not only that this master is gracious and generous, he knows his servants. Verse 13, he gives them the talents. He says, each according to his ability. This master knew these people. He knew who they were. He knew the abilities that they had. He knew their traits. And so he blessed them with his invitation into his work in a way that was most appropriate and most beneficial to them. Do we think that he gave them this talent expecting them to fail? No, he wanted to bless them. Now, today we are trained to think that the one with five, well, is obviously a little better than the one with the two. But that's not what's going on. What is going on is that the master is dealing with each servant individually. He is taking into account who that person was and how they could best join the master's work. He wants them to experience the master's joy. For the third servant, fear caused a break in that relationship. It became a barrier which stopped that servant from entering into the master's work. Fear makes the third servant misperceive who the master actually is. And so he doesn't trust the offering of the talents. And ultimately, he doesn't actually think that the master is good. And so he wants nothing to do with the situation. Fear makes him turn, turn around and flee. He says, I knew you were a hard man. But what do we see of the master? We see the master who invites them for a particular purpose. And it's not just so that they can produce more talents, but so that they can enjoy the master's company. Verse 19, after a long time, the master of the servants returned, and he called them to settle accounts. And we just heard that one produced five and one produced an extra two. But notice that the words in this section of the parable are exactly the same. The way their labor is described for the first two servants is exactly the same. You entrusted me with X talents, and I have gained X more. 
but also the master's response to each of those servants is exactly the same. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful. With few, I will put you in charge of many. Come and share in your master's joy. Literally, come and enter the joy of the Lord. The master is not concerned with amounts. He's not concerned with five or he's not concerned with two. He is concerned with faithfulness fully and faithfully embracing that relationship with him and that invitation that he offers us. The reason why God calls us to work, to reach out to others, is because the Lord wants us to experience his joy. He wants us to experience the joy he feels at work in this world. He invites us to explore that to go deeply into that. How, how sad it is then that that third servant works out of fear because that fear kept him from entering the joy of his Lord. He misunderstands the master. He misunderstands the tasks. And so he misses out the blessings that the master so freely offers and so extravagantly bestows. Do we recognize the opportunities that we have been given to live out Christ's love in this world? Are we faithful to God in what God is doing in this world? Jesus is saying that the kingdom of God is this invitation for us to join in God's work in this world. Jesus has entrusted to us his property. Now that means a whole lot. We can think about the call to strive for justice in this world, to, or the call to safeguard the integrity of creation. We can think about our baptismal promises. Right after this reading, Jesus talks about the separation of the sheep and goats, and that separation is based on feeding the hungry, providing for the thirsty, welcoming the stranger, and caring for the sick and the visitor, and visiting the prisoner. It highlights how we are to live like Jesus, spreading in word and in action the presence of our Lord in this world is the invitation that Jesus has given us. We are to see ourselves as ambassadors of Christ's love. As people who give out Christ's love, who live out Christ's grace, and who bear witness to Christ's presence in this world. That's the talent that we have been given. This is the opportunity that is open to us. And what concerns God is not the number that we produce, the five or the two. What matters most is our faithfulness to what we are invited into. When the two servants, when they come to the master and they say, you know, master, you've given us this and we have gained this more. In scripture, that word for gained is only used in the New Testament when talking about the gaining of people. So Jesus is talking about the outward living of our faith what we are invited into, so much that it draws others into this life with God. We open up, or we work to open up in people's lives their understanding of the goodness of the Master and the joy of the Master's kingdom. Is there a place in your life where fear is stopping you from moving forward? Is fear creating a barrier for you? Making it hard for you to step into the opportunity that God has given you? What's behind that fear? What is behind that fear? Do you fear that you are not good enough? That you will not produce as much as the next person? 
Remember, what the master cares about is not the five or the two. What he cares about is faithfully embracing his invitation. Faithfully stepping into the way of his kingdom. Do you fear that somehow God is not good? And all this talk about God's love and all this talk about God's grace is nothing but mumbo jumbo and it's not the real reality of the situation. Remember the heart of the master. Remember that the heart of the master is to invite you into his joy for you to experience a deeper place of intimacy. Do you fear that maybe you are just not up to the call? You're just not up to the task, whatever it might be. Remember, the master invites you based on your own ability, based on his deep knowledge and love for you. Later in scripture, the apostle John in his first letter, he writes, there is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear, because fear has only to do with punishment. We live from the basis of love, not fear. And we step into the kingdom out of love. This world around us, the people around us, they are part of God's kingdom. And God is at work in this world. God is inviting us to join him. To join him by living out our faith, in working for others' healing, in welcoming the stranger, in inviting others to experience the wonder of God's grace and graciousness. Let's not bury this invitation out of misplaced fear. Let us trust in the master's call, let us trust in his goodness, and let us boldly and lovingly step into the master's work. Amen.